Welcome to the first online fisheries update presentation for Flaming Gorge Reservoir. I'm John Walrath, the regional fisheries biologist with Wyoming Game and Fish Department responsible for Flaming Gorge Reservoir. I've been working and angling on the gorge since 2015. We held an in-person meeting in Green River on October 18, 2023. Many anglers could not attend this meeting and we hope this recording proves valuable as a means of sharing information. The in-person meeting also entailed a question answer session, which was not recorded for the purpose of sharing online. There is, however, a link to a survey that we are encouraging all anglers that watch this video to complete. This link can be found at the end of this presentation and on the Game & Fish website on the Flaming Gorge management page. Within the survey is a section where questions and comments can be made. We are also available to answer questions at the Green River Regional Office in person, by phone, and by email. Thank you again for your interest in this presentation, and we hope this content proves valuable. Flaming Gorge Reservoir is a popular destination fishery attracting anglers from across the U.S. It is over 90 miles long, and due to its length, there are latitudinal changes in productivity and fish populations. Most of the productivity occurs in the northern region, called the inflow, where the Black's Fork and the Green River supply much of the nutrients. By the time the water from the north makes it down to the canyon region in Utah, much of the nutrients have been used up. The reservoir is co-managed by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and Utah Division of Natural Resources. Each agency works closely with the other when completing field work and while conducting research projects. We also try to adopt consistent fishing regulations when biologically justifiable and socially acceptable. There are a few trout species in the reservoir, which include rainbow trout, brown trout, and cutthroat trout. Rainbow trout were first stocked in 1963, and brown trout and cutthroat trout were stocked in subsequent decades. These species have been continuously stocked over the years with highly variable stocking rates. The trout fishery is popular year-round, and as such, we have an objective to stock over 700,000 trout annually. This includes fish stocked by Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and the Jones Hole National Fish Hatchery. Smallmouth bass were stocked in 1967 and 1982. These stocking occurrences started the natural spawning population, and they have persisted without stocking since. They are an important component of the summer fishery. Unfortunately, smallmouth bass are struggling in much of the reservoir due to the high juvenile mortality once burbot became established. Burbot were illegally introduced and have a naturally reproducing population. They are classified as a non-game fish west of the Continental Divide and as a sport fish east of the Continental Divide. They are most frequently targeted by anglers during the ice season. Kokanee salmon were first stocked in 1963. This initial stocking event started a natural spawning population. In 1991, a supplemental stocking program was initiated because the lake trout population in the 1980s severely decreased the natural spawning population. The current stocking objective is 1.65 million 3-inch kokanee annually by Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and Jones Hole National Fish Hatchery. This stocking objective has basically been met or exceeded since 2014. It is also important to note that kokanee in the reservoir is serving two purposes. One to act as year-round forage for trophy lake trout and for angler opportunity. Kokanee have worked as a forage fish and as a sport fish for decades, and because they are a sport fish consuming zooplankton, they maximize the fishery for anglers. Lake trout actually established in the reservoir via drift from the Finger Lakes around Pinedale in 1964. They were also stocked in 1979 and 1983. They became a popular sport fishery in the 1980s, and our trophy-sized lake trout, those greater than 28 inches, were present in the reservoir by the mid-1970s. It is also important to note that the lake trout during this time were highly dependent on Utah chub. During the late 1980s, lake trout diet shifted to kokanee. This was the result of severe declines in Utah chub populations as the sagebrush habitat around the reservoir dissolved away. As lake trout in the 1980s shifted to consuming kokanee, 
the natural kokanee population severely declined and a decision was made to start a supplemental stocking program for kokanee in 1991. Tens of millions of fish have been stocked into the gorge since 1964. This table is showing the number of fish stocked from just the last five years for rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, and kokanee salmon. The first column in the darker gray shows what is requested by state agencies to maintain these fisheries, and the following columns represent what is actually stocked. It is important to note again that prior to 2014, kokanee stocking was highly variable, but since then, we've basically managed to meet or exceed the request. As the slide suggests, we're going to transition now into the trend data for the species we gave an overview on. The first figure here is showing catch rate data, that is the number of fish we sample per hour every year since 1983. This figure is also only representing fish greater than 12 inches in length. By removing newly stocked fish from the analysis, it becomes representative of the fishery one year post stocking. One of the takeaways here is that rainbow trout catch rates, the black circles, declined significantly in 2020 and has since remained at about half of what they were before 2020 and more similar to what the rainbow catch rate was around 2010. On the previous stocking table, some may have noticed that stocking rates for rainbow trout increased the last couple of years. And despite this increase in stocking, there was no noticeable increase in catch rates this year. This indicates that survival is lower than previous years. This same pattern was also observed for Bear River cutthroat trout, the gray triangles, with the exception of a slight increase this year. Brown trout catch rates are shown on the bottom figure and what we can see here is that their catch rates have remained relatively low except for a period before 1990 and during the early 2000s, but we know they're still providing angler opportunity in the reservoir. This figure represents catch rate data for smallmouth bass from 2023. This sampling is conducted in June when bass are spawning to help us improve our sampling efficiency. This figure is broken up by state with Utah sites shown on the left side and Wyoming sites on the right. The dash line going across to figure at 40 fish per hour represents our management objective. What we can see here is that the bass population resides primarily near the dam, the Dutch John and Cedar Springs sites, and the rest of the reservoir has relatively low catch rates. There have been a few years where we have seen some smaller bass, but more often than not, what remains in Wyoming and the upper end of Utah are larger adult bass that average about 14 inches, and those near the dam will average around 7 inches. Burbot sampling is conducted at the end of October and has occurred since 2006. This figure shows catch rates of burbot in each of the regions and an overall reservoir-wide catch rate shown by the green circles. This last fall, 2022, was the lowest documented since netting began. Last year was also the most similar regional catch rates have been to each other. Kokanee sampling is completed with the use of hydroacoustics by Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Hydroacoustics is essentially fancy fish sonar that can detect very small fish that are smaller than what anglers catch and allow us to partition the fish into size groups. On this figure, we have a black line, which represents a stocking objective of 1.65 million kokanee, a red line that reflects the actual number of kokanee stocked by Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and Jones Hole National Fish Hatchery, and the stacked bars show the hydroacoustics estimate broken down by size or age in this case. What we can see with all this data is that the stocking rate, the red line, ramped up in 2014. From 2014 to 2017, the hydroacoustics estimate also increased with increase in stocking. Additionally, despite meeting or exceeding the stocking objective from 2019 to 2022, the estimate has declined. The data also suggests that we have lower survival of age zero to age one kokanee and from age one to age two, as evident from the shrinking bar heights of the age one and age two kokanee compared to their previous years.
Knowing that the vast majority of hatchery, kokanee, and Wyoming get stocked into the gorge, we conducted a study to determine what proportion of those hatchery-raised kokanee were recruiting to anglers. The project was completed in 2021 by master's student Aaron Black at the University of Idaho. The project used microchemistry to determine the origin of the kokanee. Odorless or a fish's ear bone are calcified structures that take on elemental signatures of the water they reside in. So if there's an element that changes from one water to the next, that change in water chemistry is recorded on the otolith. The black bars on this figure represent the portion of the kokanee population that are the result of natural spawning within the reservoir. The other bars reflect hatchery sources. Samples were collected with netting and from anglers to help us determine if anglers were catching a higher proportion of hatchery fish. The main message here is that the kokanee population is heavily reliant upon natural spawning, 50 to 80 percent every year. The data also shows that anglers caught the same proportion of hatchery fish as from netting, so hatchery reared fish are no more prone to capture than natural fish. The last point here is that the hatchery kokanee are certainly contributing to the fishery. The next few slides will focus on lake trout, and before we go into that data, we want to make sure that we specify that we typically talk about them as two different groups. Those that are smaller than 28 inches, which we call small lake trout, and those that are greater than 28 inches, we call trophy. It is our concern that the declines in kokanee, rainbow, and cutthroat populations is a result of lake trout predation. The first figure here is a summary of the annual spring netting that has occurred on the gorge since the 1980s. We have year on the x-axis and catch rate on the y-axis for both trophy lake trout in the solid circles and small lake trout, the solid triangles. The data represents two different net types used each spring. The line represents the trend line for each data set with 95% confidence intervals around the trend line. Based on this figure, we can see a slow decline in the number of trophy lake trout, the solid circles, and a gradual increase of small lake trout, the solid triangles. As a reminder, this red box shows the period of time when the lake trout population caused a sharp decline in the natural kokanee population and the supplemental stocking program was initiated. The supplemental stocking program masked the effect of predation by lake trout for decades. We also need to state that the previous figure was looking at the data set from across the entire reservoir. This figure takes the same data set and breaks it down by three regions. What it shows us is that the slight trends in reservoir wide are primarily being driven by the Wyoming side of the reservoir, especially the inflow region, which is shown here in the red box, and that the Utah portion, the canyon region, has remained relatively unchanged through the decades. This next figure is breaking down the small lake trout data set a little bit more. The axis labels are the same on this figure as the previous two, and what we are doing is displaying the small lake trout data into two groups, those less than 17 inches, the solid triangles, and those between 17 and 28 inches, the solid circles. The data shows a decline in lake trout between 17 and 28 inches compared to recent years which reflects what anglers have reported this year. The data also shows that there is an increase in those less than 17 inches, which is what many anglers started to see this past winter while out on the ice. Condition of fish is a means of evaluating fish's well-being given its current length. In an ideal population, a fish will have a relative weight of 100. When relative weight is less than 100, issues such as competition for resources could be a factor. Alternatively, when a value is greater than 100, fish have an abundance of resources. This figure is looking at the condition of all lake trout sampled during the spring netting starting back in 1983. Length of the lake trout is on the bottom and their condition or relative weight score is on the left. You'll notice a very apparent pattern of good condition when lake trout are less than 18 inches, and then their condition declines to its lowest from 22 to 25 inches. Once lake trout start to switch over to mainly consuming other fishes, their condition improves to over 100. 
Most recently, the yellow data set here, the condition of trophy lake trout has declined relative to previous decades. This is likely the result of reduced prey availability, which would be kokanee. Although the lower condition observed this decade may be concerning to many anglers, lake trout have evolved to survive in unproductive systems and do not readily die from starvation. They can survive in poorer condition until food becomes available again. This next figure is a length frequency histogram. The length of fish, in this case lake trout, is on the bottom and the number of fish within a particular length group is along the left. The yellow line represents the length in which a lake trout enters the protected 28 inch length group. The vertical dashed lines reflect dividing points at 17 and 23 inches. There are a few things to point out on this figure. First, there is an abrupt drop in frequency around 22 23 inches. Secondly, there are individuals in the population between 23 and 28 inches that are recruiting to the trophy size class, and once there are persisting to maintain the trophy lake trout fishery. Once over 28 inches, we don't need many individuals to maintain this component of the fishery because of the protective regulation in place. The data is also showing a large group of lake trout less than 17 inches that we've not seen for many years. We're also seeing lake trout around 17 to 23 inches that are sexually mature, and some are as small as 16 inches. Given the number of lake trout of this size, there is a lot of spawning occurring that could quickly increase their population size, which would only increase their impact on other sport fishes. Starting in 2019, another graduate project was initiated on the reservoir to determine what lake trout are eating and to determine their age and growth. This project was completed by Chance Roberts at the University of Wyoming. Data from this figure is from lake trout sampled as part of his project from 2019. Age is along the bottom and the length of the fish is on the left. The data suggests that there are two different growth trajectories. There are some individuals in the population that have a much higher growth potential and another that maxes out around 23 inches. If you'll recall from the previous slide, we showed the length frequency graph. This data correlates nicely with that figure. Both data sets seem to indicate that we have two different populations, one that has the potential to grow and become a trophy sized fish and another that only has the potential to make it to 23 inches. This would explain why our length frequency histogram shows an abrupt decline at 23 inches. We also have individuals not growing greater than 23 inches that are 10 to 20 years old. The last comprehensive diet study on lake trout was completed back in 1991. So a large component of Chance's project was to determine what lake trout are eating. This figure is showing the diet data from lake trout smaller than 28 inches using two different techniques from his work. The figure on the right represents what was observed in their stomachs and the one on the left was using stable isotopes. That would be carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. Stable isotope work is like the motto says, you are what you eat, meaning that elemental signatures of prey items correspond to signatures within the predator fish using either their muscles, liver, skin, the figure on the left was using muscle data, so this data set is looking at their diet over roughly a year period of time. Green bars reflect bugs, zooplankton, and crayfish, and the brown bars reflect fishes. Both methods are showing that as lake trout move into larger size classes, the proportion of their diet consisting of fishes, those brown bars, also increases. The isotope model on the left is also suggesting a higher proportion of their diet consists of fishes compared to the stomach data on the right. This is likely because lake trout have a tendency to regurgitate large prey items when caught in nets and also by hook and line. So the isotope methodology is a more holistic view of what they consumed in the past year. Overall, the isotope model is suggesting that if we look solely at kokanee, this mid-brown bar, they are making up 26-28% of lake trout diet greater than 17 inches and 15% for those less than 17 inches. This information alone is quite alarming when you couple this data along with the length frequency histogram. 
These size classes of lake trout are the majority of the lake trout swimming around and kokanee make up over a quarter of their diet. This means too many of these lake trout could have a large impact on other sport fisheries. Gaining an understanding of their actual impact on other sport fishes requires knowing how many of them are out there. In 2023, we sought to determine how many small lake trout were in the reservoir by conducting a population estimate and coupling that effort with our scheduled creel where we spend a lot of time talking with anglers to see what they are targeting and what they are catching. This year was not the first time a population estimate was generated for lake trout. They were also completed in 1982 and 1988. What is different about the earlier estimates is that they were generated for the entire population. So we had to break down their estimates by size group for a more realistic comparison to our own. Doing this provided a population estimate of around 43,000 lake trout less than 25 inches. Tagging for our population estimate in 2023 started during the spawn of fall 22 and finished at the end of December. Anglers should recall that a portion of the tags had a $50 reward tied to them if an angler caught one of those fish. The tags returned by anglers from January to August this year provided the necessary data to generate our population estimate. And we helped bolster the returns for an even better estimate by also conducting netting from May through August. We used three different methods for generating our estimate. Tags returned by anglers in the creel, from gill netting, and returns on non-creel days. All these estimates individually provided little confidence, saying there were anywhere from 45,000 to 460,000 fish. However, when we combine everything together, we get an estimate of 143,000 plus or minus about 35,000. This estimate is roughly three times higher than the estimates completed in the 1980s. Based on the average reservoir elevation this past year, the estimate also equates to about 4.25 fish per acre. If anyone is familiar with Blue Mesa Reservoir in Colorado, this is twice as high as the density as they saw before they implemented their own removal program. As mentioned earlier, the population estimate was coupled with our 10-year creel survey. The creel was conducted from January through the end of August and provide us good information on what anglers are targeting and also the catch and harvest rates. This figure is showing both angler catch, the black bars, and harvest, gray bars, by season. The upper figure shows winter data and the bottom is from summer. What we can see right away when looking specifically at small lake trout is that fewer are caught during summer and harvest rate also dips. This means that more harvest is occurring over winter and on poor ice years, harvest would be greatly reduced. We can also look at the same data by region. We know most of the small lake trout reside on the Wyoming side of the reservoir and that mimics what anglers are seeing too. Most of the lake trout caught and harvested are coming from the Wyoming side, the inflow and open hills regions, the top two figures. Overall, these regions have catch and harvest rates that are five to six times greater than what is occurring in the canyon region. During the creel, measurements were also taken of many of the fish caught by anglers. This is a length frequency histogram showing the lake trout that anglers harvested during the creel, the bright green bars, and from our netting, the dark green bars. What we can see with this data is that anglers are good at harvesting lake trout that are 18 to 22 inches. We also know that there are many individuals between 13 and 17 inches that angler gear is not effectively catching. As this smaller group of fish grows up, their impact on other sport fishes will increase. We were also curious how many anglers were taking advantage of the 12 fish limit that is currently in place for small lake trout. This figure is showing how frequently anglers harvested small lake trout on a given day. Here we can see that roughly 50% of anglers are harvesting fewer than three in a trip. We can also see that 3% are harvesting their full daily creel limit of 12. This data reveals there is a lot of opportunity for anglers to harvest additional small lake trout. 
we also know that lake trout can be very difficult on any given day. This was taken into account when drafting the current regulation, as we wanted to allow anglers the ability to harvest a high number of lake trout on days when fishing is really good, while also allowing anglers to harvest smaller quantities if they desire, and still have the ability to possess up to 24 fish at home. We've completed a lot of research over the last few years and we aren't done yet. We're still completing some modeling such as bioenergetics modeling that will show which size class of lake trout has the greatest impact on sport fisheries. And coupled with the recently completed population estimate, we can provide an estimate of how many sport fishes each group consumes over a period of time. We're also completing some spawning and yield modeling work to help us dial in the appropriate amount of harvest to maintain a sustainable balance of sport fishes and trophy lake trout. One other new piece of research we're trying to accomplish is genetics. We want to know if there are two distinct lineages of lake trout in the reservoir, and if there are two distinct groups, it will help everyone more effectively target a specific group of lake trout. So stay tuned for the results from this additional work that we hope to have completed by the winter of 2024. We also want to let everyone know that lake trout are not a new problem and that actions previously taken have only helped the fishery persist. Had these actions not occurred, we are confident that what anglers are experiencing now would have happened much sooner. Some of the actions taken, including the gill netting sampling we conduct each spring to help us assess the fisheries. In 2006, small lake trout were pulled out of the trout aggregate creel limit as their own with a creel limit of eight and then that limit was again liberalized in 2019 to the current regulation of 12 fish per day. We completed numerous research projects to help us understand the fishery in its current state, and much of that work was focused around kokanee and lake trout. We have also been encouraging harvest of small lake trout and fishing derbies, both as an addition to existing derbies and the creation of new derbies specifically focused on small lake trout. Outreach is another important action item. We've relayed trout information via numerous methods to encourage anglers to harvest the small lake trout they are catching to help us maintain the gorge fishery. So we've covered a lot of data here in a short amount of time, and there's still more data that hasn't been shown. However, as we move into the last few slides, we want everyone to recall a few of the main points of this presentation in regards to our concerns with lake trout. First, this has been a slow growing problem since the 1980s. The population estimate is over three times greater than what it was in the 1980s. Small lake trout opportunistically eat sport fish. Predation is keeping sport fish from recruiting to anglers. And few anglers are harvesting over five lake trout per day. We also want everyone to know that the gorge is not alone in its situation. Other sport fisheries from around the western U.S. have already experienced sharp declines in their trout and kokanee populations as a result of predation by an overabundance of lake trout. Some managers have recovered their sport fish via aggressive management actions taken. Others are still in the process of recovering their sport fish. At the end of the day, we can all agree that we want to see the gorge turn into one of these success stories. As we move forward with wrapping up modeling and discussing management options with Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and the public, we also wanted to take some time here to go over some of the preferred actions to take heard from the public while conducting the creel. The first one is to change how and when we are stocking fish, such as using a barge to stock fish away from boat ramps where we know there is predation happening. This has been done in the past and was abandoned because it was a safety concern and required a lot of additional personnel time. Currently, no barge exists and purchasing one that would be safe to operate under gorge conditions would be extremely expensive and likely to take three to four years to procure. Some were also concerned by bird predation and recommended that stocking take place at night. This could decrease immediate predation observed while stocking but fish would still be predated on the following days. It should also be stated that predation by birds has been occurring each year and has remained relatively constant. We also heard that we should increase our stocking rates. 
When it comes to increasing stocking, our facilities are already at capacity. Stocking additional fish will also further exacerbate the problem. This was the action taken in the 1980s that only masked the true issue. It was also brought up a few times that we should look into stocking another forage fish. Currently, kokanee are the primary forage for trophy lake trout, and they also provide sport fishing opportunity for anglers. Kokanee eat zooplankton, and another forage species would likely compete for the same resource, negatively impacting kokanee. On top of this, any forage fish must come from a disease and AIS free source. There are also many instances in which a new species was added to a system with the best of intentions and there were severe unforeseen consequences to the fishery, leaving it worse than before. Another option is to do nothing and stay the course with current actions. If this route is taken, anglers could expect to see a high abundance of small lake trout and low abundances of trout and kokanee. The reduced numbers of sport fish will also mean that trophy lake trout will also be skinny. Some desire a decrease in the kokanee creel limit. This is something that could leave a few more fish in the population to spawn, but does not improve survival of juvenile kokanee. Additionally, even prior to our recent creel survey, roughly 75% of anglers targeting kokanee would harvest two or fewer a day. So decreasing the limit has marginal gains that will not return the population to prior densities and does not get at the main issue, predation. We also have the option to try and actively reduce small lake trout predation on other sport fish by removing the number of mouths out there. All prior actions were reliant upon anglers doing this, but it is becoming clear that anglers alone might not be able to decrease the population enough and additional actions like targeted netting may be necessary. Going with this option will likely result in a slow recovery of the kokanee population. Reducing lake trout populations has been shown to recover kokanee populations in other waters in the western U.S. already. We would also expect to see catch rates of small lake trout decrease, so anglers would have to work harder to catch the same number of small lake trout. The increase in other sport fish, like kokanee, will mean there's more prey available for trophy lake trout, which will equate to them improving in condition, which means heavier fish for anglers. This concludes the presentation for the Flaming Gorge Reservoir Fisheries Update. Thank you for watching this recording, and we encourage everyone to complete the survey by scanning this QR code and clicking the link that pops up. If the link does not work, you can type the address provided into your browser. Information from the survey will help us gauge the utility of this presentation and what there are for questions and comments regarding the Flaming Gorge fishery. Questions and comments can also be provided in person at the Green River Regional Office by phone or by email. Thank you again for your interest and passion for the Flaming Gorge fishery, and we hope to hear from you and see you on the water.